University in Brisbane, uh, Australia. Uh, I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional uh, custodians of the land on which we gather. Where I am, it's the Yagara and Turrbal people. And I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Tonight, uh, we have our keynote address for the Australian Association of Islamic and Muslim Studies 2021 conference. And that keynote address is being delivered by Professor Ibrahim Zain of Hamad bin Khalifa University in Doha, in Qatar. Professor Zain obtained his PhD in religion from Temple University back in 1989, and he began his career in the Department of Islamic Studies in the Faculty of Arts at the University of Khartoum in Sudan. He was appointed as an assistant professor at the International Islamic University, Malaysia, IIUM, in 1993, where he further developed his methodology of Islamic studies beyond the framework of a traditional focus on Islamic sciences. I started at the International Islamic University of Malaysia in 1994, around the time where, when Professor Zain was becoming the head of the Faculty of Islamic Revealed Knowledge and Heritage. And so our paths uh, fortunately uh, briefly crossed at that time. Since that time, uh, I've come back to Australia. Professor Zain uh, moved on to Hamad bin Khalifa University in Doha. And Professor Zain has become one of the world's leading experts on the covenants of the Prophet Muhammad, furthering his focus on religion and the history of religion and philosophy of religion. But his research findings on uh, the covenants uh, of the Prophet Muhammad have been published in a number of leading academic journals, including the Oxford Journal of Islamic Studies, Islam and Christian Muslim Relations, Ashajara and Religions. And I believe he has a couple of books on the covenants that are currently in press as well. So we are exceptionally fortunate tonight to have uh, Professor Ibrahim Zain give the keynote address for the 2021 AIMS conference. I'd like to hand over now to Professor Ibrahim to present his keynote address. Thank you, Professor Ibrahim. Thank you very much, Professor Halim. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to participate in this very important gathering. And also I'm very grateful to my colleague, uh, Professor Halim, for uh, the kind words. And uh, just allow me uh, to say this, that uh, Ahmed and I uh, were into this research project uh, since 2017. And Ahmed is a very intelligent, I mean, uh, researcher. Uh, he's not with us today because he has some other commitments. And uh, we jointly prepared this PowerPoint presentation. And I'm very grateful to him, obviously, I mean, to the colleagueship and the relationship that we have for the last uh, four years. And uh, we published together, I mean, some of these uh, works, as Halim said, and we are expecting also to publish a book, uh, inshallah, at the beginning of next year as well. Now, allow me, also to say this, that that uh, Hamad uh, Ben Khalifa University uh, is now I think I have a few things. Uh, yeah, uh, as I said to you, Hamad bin Khalifa University uh, started this project uh, in 2017. Uh, and uh, since then, uh, both of us, Ahmed and I, uh, in uh, Hamad bin Khalifa University, uh, developed this keen interest in the study of the covenants of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And obviously we've been helped by uh, quite a number of uh, uh, scholars uh, in the world. Perhaps one of them is uh, Professor Halim. Uh, 
And I would like also to say that we have also had great support from the Greek Orthodox Church, the Syriac Orthodox Church, and the Armenian Apostolic Church as well. And uh, we are also working closely, as I said at the beginning, with Professor Halim, where we are going to publish uh, two articles. Uh, and we are also preparing uh, a book, uh, which hopefully will be published in two years' time as well. Now, the, some of the publications which were, uh, I mean, uh, uh, noted by uh, uh, Professor Halim uh, in his introduction shows that we, for the last, uh, I mean, four years, we were actively working on this thing. And as I said, we also been helped by uh, a co round table uh, preparing this workshop on the covenant of the Prophet Muhammad uh, وسلم, with the Christian community, which was held in Vatican City in January uh, 19, uh, 2019. As you can say, see, I mean, from that iconic photo, I guess, it's a very beautiful photo. Uh, uh, we were there in Vatican. And Halim was there also, and uh, quite a number of uh, uh, great scholars, as well as uh, uh, religious leaders, Cardinal Tomasi, and of course, I mean, uh, Dean Shaheen, and Ahmed over there at the far end, and Halim over there at the uh, other end, uh, and myself and Lord Brennan, and some other uh, colleagues as well. Uh, the second workshop, which was also jointly organized by Go Round Table and Seher University in Istanbul, which was held in the 5th of October, 2019, uh, which was a follow-up uh, workshop where we presented some of the developments that did take place in our research on the covenant of the prophet. Uh, new faces, I guess you can tell from the photo. And the third, was a webinar is was because of the pandemic, which was held, I mean, in two different uh, cities, but managed from uh, Doha. Uh, and this was done in June 4th, uh, 2020, and was also reported by the local news uh, in Doha here. Now that shows, I mean, uh, for the last four years or so, we were actively uh, working on this very important research project. And as I said, I mean, we've been helped by so many people, and we also developed throughout the years a research circle uh, from all over the world, from Armenia, from US, from uh, Australia, from Malaysia, from uh, other parts of the world as well. Now, to begin with, if we ask this question, what are the covenants? Uh, they are documents of protection granted to non-Muslims communities by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the rightly guided caliphs. And they form part of the political documents of early Islam known as official documents. And I just would like to refresh your memory that two decades ago, one of the leading scholars in uh, Islamic political thought reminded us that only 18% of the Islamic legacy or Muslim legacy on uh, political thought have been published. And he also told us that only 6% of this legacy has been utilized by scholars in their works. That shows how little, I guess, uh, the community of the scholars achieved in understanding and presenting these important documents of early Islam. And no doubt, I mean, what we are doing here also in the studies of the covenants of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and relating these documents uh, of early Islam to the rest of the very important documents which were issued by the Prophet and uh, the rightly guided caliphs as well. Now, also these covenants were referenced in Muslim and non-Muslim historical sources 
and therefore constituting part of a shared historical memory between Muslims and non-Muslims. Now, there are a number of uh, studies, scholarly studies, and most important of them to date, uh, the one which was uh, written by uh, Louis Sheikhu uh, in 1909, uh, and then the one which was written by Nicholas in 1909, and Naum Shukair uh, in 1916, and Ahmed Zaki Basha uh, in 1926, and then Hamidullah, of course, the one who popularized this uh, and brought it into the uh, mainstream academia in 1956. And most important of all, I guess, is John Andrew Moro, who drew our attention uh, to these important documents of early Islam in his very famous book, The Covenants of the Prophet Muhammad with the Christians of the world, which was published in 2013. And since then, he was actively uh, propagating and, and researching this very important topic. Now, some needed, I mean, uh, 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 a very important observation in this regard needed to be put forward, which is that Nicholas Naum Shukair and John Andrew Moro argued for the authenticity of the covenants while Louis Sheikhu Ahmed Zaki Basha and Hamidullah believe, believed that they were forgeries. And we have also to note that all analysis of the covenants of the prophet has until very recently been done in silos by looking at individual covenants in the custody of one religious community or the other. The only exception to this is the work of Professor John Andrew Moro. Now, this is a very important, I guess, uh, uh, this is a, a major drawback uh, in the studies of uh, political documents of early Islam, where scholars will just pick up one document and focus on it. So you have so many studies on uh, the constitution of Medina by different scholars, as if this was the only document which was issued by the Prophet And you also uh, find that some studies on uh, the, uh, the Sifin arbitration by Martin Hinz and others, which also focuses only on the Safin arbitration, as if this is the only document which uh, was in early Islam. And it is the time for us now, when we study all these documents, we've got to bring them together in an integrated method, in a comparative way, where we will understand actually uh, the intellectual milieu and the political milieu in which all these documents were issued. Now, important thing needed to be added here that the scribal lineages for the, Christ, uh, for the Christian covenants are two. Uh, the first covenant was written by Ali ibn Abi Talib and granted to the monks of Mount Sinai. And the second covenant was written by Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan and granted to the Christians of Najran. Of course, more covenants uh, were written to other Christian communities, most probably existed, but we do not know anything about them yet. Which makes actually our study and, and works on the covenant of the prophet always a work in progress. Now, for St. Catherine documents, uh, they are available online through the Library of Congress. We have six Arabic scrolls, two Arabic booklets, and 15 Ottoman Turkish scrolls. And the original covenant is said to have been taken back to Istanbul by Sultan Salim in 1517 uh, after his ex expedition in Egypt, when he was going back to Istanbul. He visited St. Catherine Monastery and took the original copy and gave them a copy to testify that he has taken the original copy from them. And that copy made its way in Munshat al-Salatin 
uh, which was written by Faridun Bey, uh, which was completed in 1575. Now, Prophet's covenant with the Christians of Najran uh, documented in ecclesiastical history, the Chronicle of Sird, which was composed in the 10th century. And we also noted that numerous manuscripts exist manuscripts exist in different localities, e.g. the Matina Dara in Armenia, in Yerevan, Yerevan and Armenia, and John, and John Highlands Library in Manchester, UK, the Monastery of St. George al Humaira in Syria and other places. And I've got to say this, that I'm very grateful to my uh, uh, research, who, who started as my research assistant, and now he's my colleague as well, Ahmed, he was the one actually who made this kind of uh, journey to Mount Athos, to St. Catherine, uh, to Matina Daran uh, in Yaravan, Armenia, because he is young, and also because he carries a, a British passport. So his travels were made very easy, whereas I'm carrying still a Sudanese passport, which would make it very difficult for me, I guess, to travel uh, and go there. But I think he enjoyed that kind of spiritual spiritual journey that he made to these important religious uh, places in the world. As somebody was saying in our group, uh, uh, this is uh, John Dalla Costa, that Ahmed had this uh, spiritual pilgrimage to these very important places uh, in, in the ancient world and in our world as well of today. Now, the prophetic covenants with other religious communities, we have two prophetic co covenants to the, Jews, uh, to the Jewish communities existing now in our custody, and we studied them. And we have one prophetic covenant to the Magi and one prophetic covenant to the Samaritans, and three covenants of Umar to the Christians, and one covenant of Ali to the Christians, and one covenant of Ali to the Magi as well. Now, uh, there is uh, a problem of transmitting all these documents. Of course, I mean, uh, uh, it is understood. I mean, this is the work of the historian. And it was also our concern when we started this project to develop a methodology of understanding uh, the transmission nuances of these important doc documents and also uh, to develop a terminology that would make uh, the students and, and the scholars uh, in this field very comfortable when they try to understand and research uh, these manuscripts as well. So we are saying in the absence of the originals, originals, we have copies of the originals as manuscripts and copies of the originals reproduced in ecclesiast ecclesiastical histories and then we have also references to the existence of these official decrees in Muslim and Christian uh, historian works, including partial quotations as well. So this is what is available to us uh, as researchers and what is available to the community of the researchers as well. I mean, we have manuscripts, we have copies in these uh, uh, works, uh, which were done by uh, historians, Muslims and non-Muslims as well. Now, that led us to develop a way of understanding these documents and, and have a very clear understanding of the episteme of each document and how these different epistemes uh, would reflect different sensibility in answering the question, how do we know the existence of these documents? The first episteme, we classified it as document-based, which means original document was seen and copied by a scribe with a brief description of how it looked and where it was found. And the second episteme is, is not called document-based episteme, where a document-based with an isna accompanying the transmission of the document. And the third last episteme is the isnad based. The document is transmitted through an isnad 
but there is no information about the original document. Uh, this classification is very important, which tells us now uh, we are not only uh, focusing on uh, literary sources, but rather we are focusing on literary sources as well as documentary sources. So for the revisionists, uh, the difference between us and them, we are not focusing only on uh, documentary sources, but rather we integrate in the docu documentary sources with uh, the literary sources as well. And for the literary sources, we have these two categories, it's not document based and it's not based uh, and it's not based, uh, 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 I mean, documentation. Now, the most important thing for our uh, literary sources was to look into these textual parallelisms. Uh, and these textual parallelisms were reflected in the ipsisma verba uh, and the expressions in documents found in Muslims and non-Muslim sources with no evidence of cross-communal borrowing or influence. Uh, that's very important, I guess, to keep in mind. Uh, and the second thing for the textual within these different documents uh, of the covenants of the prophet, which were held by different uh, religious communities. Uh, so the first thing we try to see the ipsisma verba between all these documents being given to different communities at different times, of course. And the second one was to look into kind of parallelism between the covenants of the prophet and the documents of early Islam. That is, for instance, the constitution of Medina, the letter to Al-Ala ibn al-Hadrami, and land grant to Tamim al-Dari, and compact with the people of Najran, and Khalid ibn al-Walid's treaty with the people of Damascus and the Safin arbitration agreement, they all have textual parallelism with the covenants of the prophet. Now, when we are focusing on the scribal conventions, uh, we were looking into this, that there is a text, the body of a text with a scribe's name, date, witness, and a seal. And we also realized that these uh, documents were supported by archaeology as well, uh, such as the inscriptions of Hamad Gadar and the Dam in Taif, which was uh, uh, established, which was built by Mu'ayyah ibn Abi Sufyan, as well as the letters of Shuraiq ibn Qurra, which was written on papyrus. So here we have inscriptions, we have papyrus, uh, and we have also the documentary evidence as well with a very specific uh, kind of uh, convention. Now the evidence points to scribal conventions having been used on all kinds of written texts using the Hijri calendar. This is what we realized and we have published an article on the Hijri calendar for those who are interested in this thing. Now, for the date matching, this is what we realize that the, the covenants with the Christians of Najran, when we convert the date 29 Rabi' al awwal 29 Rabi' al Thani, we realize that it falls on Monday, 7th of, 7th of October, uh, uh, 625. And we also realize that the dating of the Prophet covenants with the Jews of Khaybar and Magna uh, would come into Friday, the third of Ramadan, ninth uh, of the Hijra calendar, and then Friday as well, the 14th December, 6.30. And Safin arbitration agreement, which was also on Wednesday, 16 Safar, uh, 37, the Hijra calendar, and uh, of August, uh, 657. These three important dates of these three documents tell us that they, they were accurate when we convert them of the week, day, in all these three instances. That can't, can't be a kind of a coincidence. 
uh, that we, when we convert the Hirjri calendar uh, to the Gregorian calendar, we maintain the same day of the week. Now, more on the historical authenticity. Uh, we would like to draw your attention Uh, to the fact that uh, all these uh, documents share, as I said, I mean, uh, the same expressions, uh, same epsisma verba, phraseology, and the scribal convention as well. And the companions adopted the same language as the prophet in their political documents, which is understandable. And this explains. The, strike, the, the striking resemblance between the Safin arbitration agreement and the Prophet covenants with the Christians. And you have to keep in mind that uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib and Mu'ayyah ibn Abi Sufyan are the one who drafted the Safin arbitration uh, when they uh, ended the, the battle, the very bloody battle uh, of Safin. Now also the recognition of the covenants by Muslim rulers throughout the history, the Fatimids, uh, as well as Salahuddin al Ayyubi, who granted uh, uh, an edict to uh, the Armenian Patriarchate, they keep still uh, that edict with them uh, in, in the Patriarchate in Jerusalem. And the Ottomans throughout the history also, they recognized. Uh, the authenticity of these covenants, and they accept them as legal documents. Now, our research findings, as you can tell, uh, shows that many documents, I mean, uh, not only given to the Christians, but to different religious communities, I mean, Christians, Jews, I mean, to Samaritans, Zoroastrians, uh, and, and Jews, uh, and they were issued by the Prophet وسلم, and also renewed by the caliphs, the, the four guided caliphs after him as well, and, and Mu'ayyah ibn Abi Sufyan as well. As a general rule, uh, treaties are absent from the Hadith books. This is uh, one important observation of God to be kept in mind, uh, that if somebody is saying that we don't have the covenants in the literature of had in the hadith literature i mean the answer to this is that whoever studied the hadith literature will come to the conclusion that uh, all these uh, important documents such as the constitution of medina for instance did not find its way in the hadith compilations uh, it was only uh, uh, it was only brought into the biography of the prophet sallallahu by ibn ishaq and later by Abu Abaid ibn al-Qasim in his book, Kitab al-Amwal, which is about, uh, I mean, financial transactions. And obviously it wasn't at all uh, a book of, of hadith by any uh, standards. So we have to keep in mind this very important observation that the absence, the very absence of these documents in the hadith literature cannot be taken against them uh, because there is a different sensibility for the Hadith collectors. But in Hadith literature like Bukhari and Muslim as well, there was a reference to these kinds of documents, a very passing reverence uh, attributed to Umar ibn al-Khattab. And the third thing, written documents issued by the Prophet should be regarded as historical fact, which in the biography of the Prophet, it has been, uh, clearly mentioned that he issued documents to non-Muslim communities, specifically, I mean, Christians and Jews. And both Muslims and non-Muslim sources explicitly agreed on this. 
Now, this makes the main question is not if the prophet wrote official decrees, but rather where are these official decrees now? And more importantly, what was in them? Now, we decided actually in our research uh, to utilize this category of thought, the shared historical memory, because it's a very important and relevant to what we are doing for authenticating these documents. We noticed that Agabius, uh, who was writing in, uh, uh, who died in, in 9-4 to the Christian era, uh, was the best one who articulated the shared historical memory between Muslims and non-Muslims. He said, the Arabs mobilized at Yathrib. Head of them was a man called Muhammad ibn Abdullah, and he became their chief and king. Christians from among the Arabs, as well as other people came to him. He granted them protection and wrote for them documents, and he did so to all other nations who opposed him. By that, I mean the Jews, the, Mag the Jews, Magi, Sabians, and others. They gave him allegiance and took from him a guarantee of safety on the condition that they would pay him the jizya and haraj, the land tax. This same statement was later produced by the Coptic historian Ibn al makin who died in 1273. Now, uh, I put first. Uh, Uh, Agabius, uh, because he, he was the best uh, to articulate that kind of shared historical memory, and, and later on, historians who came after him repeated this important, actually, uh, phrase of his. Now, historically speaking, Catholicos Ishoyab the said of the Ashurian Church of the East, uh, who was contemporary, I guess, of, uh, of the early uh, Muslims, uh, early Islam, I mean, the time of uh, Muawiyah and perhaps uh, uh, the late, uh, I mean, the early uh, Umayyad dynasty, he expressed how Muslims are no enemy to, the Christ to Christianity, but they are even praisers of our faith, honorers of our Lord's priests and holy ones, and supporters of churches and monasteries. So that, that was a kind of uh, uh, gratitude which was shown in these books of history, which were written by these great ecclesi ecclesiastical historians in their annals. Now, also John Babankaye, uh, he also, uh, had this very important quotation. A man among them named Muawiyah took the reins of the government of government of the two empires, Persians, Persian and Roman. Justice flourished under his reign and great peace was established in the countries that were under his government and allowed everyone to live as they wished. They had received, as I said, from the man who was their guide, that is Prophet Muhammad, an order that is a covenant in favor of Christians and monks, which meant they were exempted from paying taxes to the government. Now, that kind of memory, which is a good one, uh, and which is written in highly poetic language, praising uh, Muslims at his time, specifically uh, Muawiyah, uh, the commander of the believers, uh, at this time. Now, Samuel Ofani had the same, I guess, quotation, uh, who also praises Muslims and showed how they were allowed actually to practice their religion. Uh, just, just echoing what has been said by uh, great ec ec ecclesiastical historians uh, before him. Now, Bar Hebraeus, 
another uh, ecclesiastical historian who explicitly, explicitly states how the covenant with the Christians of Najran was an eternal pact granted to all Christians. A description of the covenant is very detailed and matches the text in the Chronicles of Sir. It is true, I mean, uh, these great uh, ecclesiastical historians were writing, some of them were borrowing some of uh, important phrases as well as uh, important descriptions which appeared in the works of the historians before them. But they all show, share that kind of uh, uh, pleasant historical uh, memory between Muslims and, and Christians that fostered uh, peaceful coexistence. And you have to keep in mind the background of, to this was the very bloody war which humanity suffered from in the ancient world when the two great empires of the time in late antiquity, the Byzantines and uh, and the Persians were having, where destruction of places of worship, worship and, and uh, forced conversion did take place at that time. And it was legalized by both. I mean, the, uh, uh, the Byzantine empires, empire in Justinian laws and, and the emperors who came after him as well. And the thing was, was not far from this. Uh, when it comes to religious freedom in the Sassanid uh, Empire as well. Now, if you look into the values of the covenants, if we would like to, to study now the covenants after we uh, studied, I mean, the external aspect of it, which is the authenticity of these documents. Now, if you look into the document and try to Look in, into the covenant, into the values which were enshrined in these covenants. The first and important one was in line with uh, the Quranic verse, and this Quranic verse also was cited in one of these uh, uh, one of these covenants as well. That no compulsion in religion, and it was also equally important, I guess, in most of these covenants, on in all of these covenants you'll have this clause that no Muslim can ever force a non-Muslim to embrace Islam. That was a, a very important, I guess, principle that fostered uh, religious freedom. And non-Muslims are granted for religious freedom. And Muslims are not allowed to interfere in their religious and personal affairs as well. They were completely autonomous while they are living under the Islamic rule when it comes to their religious affairs. And places of worship are to be preserved and shall not be destroyed, which was not the case in late antiquity. The context actually of uh, making these documents, uh, the historical uh, uh, context shows that it was rampant. I mean, the destruction of places of worship was done by both by the Byzantine uh, emperors, as well as by Persian emperors and minor also rulers uh, in the vicinity as well. Non-Muslims will only be taxed according to their capability. That's a very important principle which has been laid down in these uh, uh, covenants and be repeated in different ways. Then the covenants are eternal. This is a very important thing, it, it, which meant when the Prophet Sallallahu issued these covenants, insisted that they were up until the end of the time. Uh, they are not supposed to be revoked or canceled by whoever comes after the Prophet Sallallahu meaning that they granted non-Muslims inalienable, inalienable rights pertaining to their lives, wealth, property, religion, and places of worship. The covenants embody universal values necessary for peaceful coexistence. And I think these uh, became universal values after they were issued by the Muslims. Humanity, after the great suffering that they went through uh, during late antiquity, realized that these are the values that needed to be upheld for people to live uh, together uh, and enjoy the good things of this world. 
So I, I'm not sure, I mean, it is very clear. I mean, these were not at all uh, universal values accepted by uh, the political rulers of late antiquity before the coming of Islam, before the advent, so, the advent of Islam. And it is good that after, I mean, the, the, the covenants of the Prophet Sallallahu they became universal values that they were shared, cherished by Muslims and non-Muslims alike. Now, the implications for uh, peaceful coexistence uh, is very clear. I mean, if we are going to, pay, to, to base the Christian-Muslim relations on the values, which are now uh, recognized by both, I mean, Muslims and non-Muslims as well, so that will help a great deal in fostering a harmonious relationship between Muslims and Christians, which means Muslims who are living uh, in uh, predominantly Christian uh, countries and Christians who are living in predominantly uh, Muslim countries. So religious minorities in Muslim majority countries are going to benefit a great deal from this. Uh, likewise, I expect uh, that religious minorities in non-Muslim countries would also uh, benefit a great deal from upholding these uh, universal values. And we have growing Muslim communities in the West when they are enlightened and educated about the history of humanity and how Muslims actually dealt with Christians when they were under their rules, perhaps some of them intelligent ones, uh, might think of reciprocate that kind of historical uh, memory which we had together as Muslims and, and Christians. And of course, this is a, an antidote to the clash of civilization thesis. And it will, of course, uh, consolidate the alliance of civilization thesis as well. Now, this would promote mutual respect, no doubt about it and peaceful coexistence between people of different faces if we are going to upheld the values which are enshrined in these documents. I'm not saying that these are the only values that uh, have got to be realized. There are other values. And through the maturation of humanity, perhaps they might uh, find better ways of realizing these universal values. Now, for my conclusion, and perhaps uh, Ahmed would share this conclusion with me, what we had done so far within these uh, four years of extensive research on these documents uh, can be summarized as follows. That it, it is important to keep in mind this textual parallelism. Uh, I mean, uh, like an academic jar jargon, the ipsis verba. Uh, in our analysis of these documents, in our analysis of these different documents which were given to different uh, communities, different uh, religious communities. And we also have got to look into the parallelism between uh, these documents of early Islam and the covenants of the prophet. As I said to you, I mean, right from the beginning, the major postulates that we worked with is to say enough is enough. We are not going to study these documents as the only documents which were issued in early Islam, but rather we would like to collect all these early documents available to us and study them in their totality and make a kind of uh, uh, parallelism and comparisons uh, based on scribal conventions date matching calculations and early historical references, and of course, archeological archeologi data, which means here, our methodology would integrate the two aspects, the documentary aspect and the literary aspect of these documents. Second, that the shared historical memory points to the emanation of the covenant from a common source. Any fair-minded, I guess, a scholar who would look into this would come to the conclusion that, uh, that there must be a common source 
out of which all these documents come out. And of course, I mean, this uh, uh, common source at the end of the day is the Prophet Sallallahu and, and his time. Now, taken in their totality, all these documents, and especially the, uh, the covenants of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they convey a yearning for justice and peaceful coexistence. And as I said to you, I mean, the context and the background to this was what was going on in late antiquity, the bloodshed uh, that was taking uh, place in late antiquity when Islam uh, came into existence. Now, in addition to this, the covenants have a historical precedent to shape the future of Muslims and non-Muslim relations. For like almost 1,000 years, Muslims and non-Muslims uh, and other religious communities as well, I mean, Muslims and Christians and other uh, uh, religious communities, their places of worship were preserved. And, and, uh, and they live under the Islamic uh, law without the, them being forced uh, to change their religion. And they develop their own community, develop their own uh, history, they develop their own system of education for like 1,000 years. Peace was there in, I mean, a very important place, uh, which is highly regarded by Muslim Christians and Jews, uh, Jerusalem, when Muslims took over Jerusalem, peace was uh, established on that important city. Uh, and the three communities lived together side by side and they cooperated. Uh, and, 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 and it is it is a living example, perhaps, uh, in the history and in the memory of uh, those who studied that kind of that very important uh, history of 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 humanity now would like to share with you uh, I, I think my i have just just one minute left perhaps uh, i would like to share with you uh, this is a copy of the covenant of the prophet with the monks of mount sinai which has been pro reproduced in munshat al-salatin by Faridun Bey. Uh, and this is a copy of the Covenant of Omar with the Christians of Jerusalem, which was in which is in the Ottoman archives. Uh, last but not least, this is the impression of the Prophet hand on the gate of the dependency of St. Catherine's monastery in Palat, Istanbul, now in the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate in Fanar. The hand found on many copies of the covenants is a symbolic representation of the Prophet's eternal pledge to protect Christians. And thank you very much. And uh, now I guess I yield the microphone to my uh, friend uh, and colleague, uh, Halim. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Zain. Uh, that, that was a very enlightening presentation. I'm sure everyone gained a lot out of it, but I'm sure everyone now needs to do some homework because there's a, I think there's a lot of background reading to do in order to be able to appreciate uh, the detail that you provided us with tonight. So we have a few questions uh, that have come up in the chat. Would it be all right if I uh, just went through some of those questions and then um, and you answer them? And then there may be some other people that would like to just verbalize uh, their questions. So perhaps we can take a few like that as well. So if I just go back through the chat, um, there was a question about uh, this person says, Professor Ibrahim, you mentioned silos. Uh, the covenants of the Prophet Muhammad uh, was, was actively discussed after ISIS emergence in 2013-14. Uh, do we know why it is that little is known about such important area of work uh, and uh, little has been done to publicize them widely. Why, why is, I think the person is asking, why is it that we uh, haven't in, in you know, previous decades uh, learnt much about uh, the covenants? Why, why now and why not before? Yeah, I think this is a good question. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, why is it 
uh, perhaps some of us might say, why is it all of a sudden now uh, we are looking into these uh, documents and bringing them to the forefront? Uh, I, I would like to just to say this, that, uh, well, I mean, these documents were studied. Uh, I mean, were studied by Muslims and non-Muslims uh, at the beginning of uh, last century. And there were also studies of these covenants uh, before that. Now, I mean, so some would, would say, I mean, that, that uh, the academia now uh, got a keen interest into this, maybe because of this context that we had uh, ISIS and these extremist group, groups. Uh, but to my mind, I guess, uh, whoever is following the kind of research which has been done uh, would not ask uh, this question by saying, why now? Mm. I mean, my, my feeling is that, I mean, it was always uh, being studied uh, by, by researchers uh, and these documents uh, were part, I guess, of the, uh, of the bureaucracy of the Ottoman Empire. We are speaking about perhaps uh, more than uh, three or four centuries that these documents were part of the regal documents of the bureaucracy of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and uh, Ottoman sultans, they continued actually to reissue uh, these documents to different uh, uh, churches. Uh, but I, I also should, should say this, that uh, maybe Western scholarship and perhaps the Orientalists were not interested in this kind of of, of, of documents, uh, maybe it is part of what, uh, the kind of the hidden agenda uh, against uh, whatever is Islamic uh, need not be actually presented the way it should be presented. I mean, I, mean, I, 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 I uh, this is perhaps uh, a kind of a speculation. I'm not saying all uh, Western uh, uh, scholars, I'm pretty sure, I mean, there are some Western scholars uh, who were fair-minded people uh, and, and who brought into the forefront uh, these uh, uh, documents for us to look into. I mean, I have in mind Considine, for instance, great Considine, a great uh, Islamist uh, who also recognizes uh, these documents. But again, uh, I mean, my answer is going to be very speculative. I mean, uh, it's very difficult to know why because the dynamics uh, of a document being uh, studied or being sidelined uh, are very complex. I have in mind also the constitution of Medina, for instance. Uh, the constitution of Medina uh, started to be studied by Wilhausen. And when Wilhausen actually drew the attention to this very important document, uh, Muslims also started actually to pay attention, I mean, contemporary Muslim scholars as well, uh, started to pay attention to this document and after him also uh, other uh, leading Orientalist scholars started to recognize this very important document of early Islam. So as I said, perhaps the, uh, the dynamics of why now uh, is quite difficult. I mean, mm -hmm. it will be very simplistic, I mean, to say that sure. and to speculate that it's only one reason for it. Absolutely. And not the other reasons as well. And it should also be understood that, um, you know, a book that comes out in 2013, um, there are many years of research that comes before that. So it's not as though it had just it was done in 2013. There were, there were years of research prior to that. And I think the other important point to note here is that previous research like that of Muhammad Hamidullah, for example, uh, tended to look at a document uh, in isolation and what uh, Professor Ibrahim Zain and Ahmed al-Wakil have done is to look at many documents together and then raise the question, how is it that uh, multiple communities uh, in geographically dispersed locations could possibly have documents that read very similarly? Uh, and, you know, the, the argument here is essentially that uh, there must be a single source rather than these documents being forged by, you know, multiple communities. Um, who are geographically dispersed and, 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 and differentiated in, in other ways. Another question here is about uh, the work of Fred Donner. 
Uh, and Fred Donner's book was published, I think, in 2012, um, Muhammad and the Believers, uh, The Origins of Islam. Uh, he talks about Christians and uh, Muslims and Jews being part of a community of believers, a community of, of Mormon. Um, what is the relationship between this idea of Fred Donner of Muslims, Christians and Jews being having much more harmonious relations than uh, what has kind of been narrated over time historically and the covenants? What implications do the covenants have for Donner's perspective here? Well, I think that the, I mean the thesis of Fred Donna in this regard uh, might might be uh, helpful, I guess, in 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 understanding shed some some light on the covenants of the Prophet as well. Uh, though I myself personally uh, do not share with him the the idea that uh, the study of the covenant, uh, the study of the uh, the constitution of Medina. Uh, I've got to be seen as the Jews and Muslims are, are one united Ummah. Uh, I, I don't share that, that kind of, uh, of interpretation which has been given by him. But I think, as to answer, I mean, the question, I mean, I, I think we feel that there was a kind of, uh, what, in, in these covenants, the different clauses uh, would tell us that living harmoniously uh, between Christians and Muslims and perhaps uh, other uh, religious communities was based on the fact that the principles which are applied to Muslims are equally applied to non-Muslims. It means that there are rights which are given to the Christians, uh, which are also given to the Muslims. And nobody has the right actually to uh, take these inalienable rights from the Christians or, or other uh, communities as well. Muslims are, are seen as guardians, uh, not in, in, in a paternal sense of the word, but protectors perhaps is, is a better word. And, and the fellow human beings who adhere to Christianity or any other religious faith are seen as one brotherhood in that sense. Um, it's not an ummah, uh, in a religious sense, but rather one human brotherhood, they are living together. So uh, uh, they are distinguished from the non-believers, no doubt about it. And when it comes to Christians and Jews, I mean, these are the people of the book. I mean, uh, this is a kind of a, a, a Quranic term which makes the Christians and, 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 and Jews very close uh, to the Muslims and they share the same historical memory and the same historical religious uh, uh, patriarch, uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam. Mm -hmm. Now, going back to Fred Donner thing, I mean, uh, my feeling is, I mean, he was criticized, vehemently criticized by different people for wrong reasons. But I think he brought into our attention a very important thing that uh, the vision of Islam was a, a very inclusive vision. And I think on that level, he is correct. Uh, the vision of Islam, which continued up until uh, uh, the abolish of the Khilafah, was a vision of inclusiveness. And that was very clear. I mean, if you compare it with the European history uh, at the time, I mean, uh, and great scholars, I mean, uh, and, and philosophers like John Locke, was educating, I guess, the Christians of his time by telling them, why don't you be like the Serassians in Istanbul and tolerate your uh, Christian uh, fellows who adhere to a different denomination or a different church? Mm -hmm. At that time, I mean, in Istanbul, you can see all the Christians living together, which was not matched by any European city at that time as well. So that, that vision of inclusiveness in Fred Donner I mean, uh, it's correct, and I agree with him on that level. Perhaps I have some reservations on some of the things that he said, but I think he was a great scholar. Yeah. He was, of course. Professor Ibrahim, in your presentation, you, you talked about references to the covenants or um, kind of um, maybe indirectly uh, from, from non-Muslim sources. What about uh, from uh, early Muslim sources? Um, could, could you tell us something about 
references to the covenants we can find uh, in the writings of uh, relatively early Muslim scholars, jurists or, or others? Yeah, I mean, it is true. I mean, uh, uh, there was a clear reference. I mean, we are again speaking about the jurist. Uh, Abu Yusuf, in, in uh, his Kitab al-Amwal, uh, he referenced the, the uh, I mean, phrases from the covenants of, I mean, we, we are not saying that he was saying that uh, uh, that the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam issued a covenant to St. Catherine Monastery. Mm -hmm. No, of course not. Uh, but some of the clauses that he referred to uh, and, and a direct reference to uh, the Najran Covenant, uh, which is uh, a well-established historical fact in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and which has been also renewed by the caliphs after him, Abu Bakr, Umar, uh, Usman, and Ali as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, a, a reference, it was widely referenced, this uh, Najran Covenant, which was issued by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the Christians and Jews of Najran. And I have to keep in mind that in that time, Najran was a, a city where Jews and different Christian denominations were living together. It was like an, a, a second Urshalim or uh, Jerusalem uh, of, 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 of the Arabian Peninsula. And, and it was a, a city which has so many different uh, uh, churches, as well as the Jews were residing there uh, among the Christians. So when the Prophet Sallallahu issued the covenant of Najran, it was issued to the Christians and the Jews at the same time. And this was referenced in uh, Tabari, in Blazari, uh, and, and uh, was left referenced in Abu Yusuf and some other uh, historical uh, works by uh, Muslims. So we are not saying that uh, the covenants were not referenced in Islamic sources. They are. They are uh, extensively referenced in the Islamic sources. But we have to keep in mind that not the same uh, document as it is in the custody of the Christians. Mm -hmm. This has to be kept in mind. Perhaps the only exception to this uh, is the St. Catherine uh, document, which has been taken by uh, Sultan Salim after his expedition to Egypt when he was coming Back, going back to Istanbul, uh, he visited the, uh, the St. Catherine Monastery. And when they presented him with this document, he took the document. And then the document was uh, reproduced in Mansha at Salati. Okay. I mean, this, this guy, Faridun Bey, was a high ranking uh, uh, officer in the bureaucracy of uh, the Ottoman Empire at his time. He was uh, Sheikh al Qawanin, they say. He was the custodian of the laws of the empire at his time. Professor Ibrahim, could you tell us about, um, there's a comment here about, you know, viewing the covenants. Where can people go to see what they look like? Uh, I mean, in digital copy or, or, or in some other form, where are, they, where are they stored at the moment? Where can people see them for themselves? Uh, I think different places. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, to start with uh, St. Catherine Monastery, uh, where we have uh, uh, a collection of uh, Ali's uh, covenants, uh, the covenants which were described by uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib, and uh, in Cyprus as well, in Mount Athos in Greece, uh, in Istanbul, and uh, in the Matina Daran in Yerevan, uh, in Armenia. Uh, and some of these copies actually were taken uh, by uh, the, the, colonial, the colonialists, I mean, the, when they came to the Muslim world, uh, taken by the British, taken by the French, uh, and they are in their custody. I mean, it's, it's in, uh, in, in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris and uh, in Manchester University. And most important of all, I mean, in, 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 in the United States of America, I mean, you find copies of these in the Congress, uh, the Library of Congress and this uh, Hill Museum and some other places, of course. But as I said, uh, that's not a comprehensive, uh, uh, what, uh, uh, note on all these uh, covenants. 
you have to keep in mind when I started, I said, it has been reported by uh, scholars of political uh, Islamic thought that only 18% of the legacy of Islam on political uh, uh, I mean, treaties and political documents uh, were published. And it was also noted and observed that only 6% of that legacy uh, has been utilized in scholarly works. So how little we know actually of uh, that rich legacy. I'm not speaking about the Orientalists, but I'm speaking about Muslims and, and Orientalists alike. I'm speaking about uh, things written in Arabic, things written in Farsi or Urdu, or uh, things written in uh, in French, uh, in French, German, or English, of course. Uh, so we know that little about documents of early Islam. We have to admit that. As scholars, we have to admit that. We have a long way to go uh, to claim that we know everything about uh, early Islam. Mm. And that would actually humble these revisionists. I don't have anything uh, against them. I think they gave us a, a wake up call that uh, there is another way to, to study documents of early Islam instead of only relying on the literary source we have to bring into uh, consideration, I mean, uh, inscriptions, papyrus, especially this Greek papyrus uh, from Egypt and the Holy Land, and coins also needed to be brought into uh, our documentation of what happened in early Islam as well. Mm -hmm. But I disagree with them when they completely uh, neglect and decide to do away with the literal source as well. Thank you. Uh, I noticed there's a hand or two up and I'll come to those hands in a moment. I'll just finish off with the questions that have been uh, written into the chat. Uh, one of these questions is, there's a couple of questions that worded in different way about the relationship between Hadith and the covenants and the Isnad of the covenants and the Isnad of Hadith. Can you just maybe clarify for the audience uh, the, something about the difference between the covenants and Hadith and the way both have been transmitted. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, I guess, uh, Professor Halim. This is a very difficult question to answer, I guess. Uh, perhaps I'll, I'll say a few things and, uh, and leave the microphone to you, I guess. Uh, I know you are more, uh, I mean, knowledgeable about these things than myself. I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah, but let, let me just say this, that, uh, uh, the hadith epistemology is very clear, uh, which is based on the, the chain of transmission, uh, the credibility of uh, those who appeared, their names appeared in the chain of transmission, and uh, also their memory. And according to these two principles, uh, uh, they classified the hadith. Uh, uh, and, 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 and make a hierarchy of these ahadiths. Now, this epistemology is, is based on, uh, as we said, uh, as I said in my presentation, on, on the whole idea of the isnad. And, and the credibility, there is one important thing in the credibility. I mean, the, the, the person whose name is going to appear in the chain of transmission should be a Muslim. I mean, you can't have in the hadith uh, 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 transmission a non-Muslim. I mean, as Imam uh, Shafi'i, when he uh, extensively uh, researched this issue in his book, Risala, it was made very clear. This is about a chain of transmission of a number of people who had this hadith, and it can be attributed to the Prophet wasallam. And this chain of transmission is manned by a group of Muslims. They have to be Muslims. I mean, part of their credibility is that they should be believers, they should be Muslims. So you can't find a Christian there. Now, uh, the Christians of early Islam, they didn't have that kind of, uh, of, of methodology and that kind of esteem. But rather, whatever uh, uh, historical uh, narratives they are having, they base that historical narrative on a document. I mean, these ec ecclesiastical historians uh, of late antiquity and even before that, 
uh, they will base their research and their historical narratives on an existing document. And usually these documents will be in the custody of, of the church, in the library of the church and so forth. So if you are going to judge these uh, uh, documents that are in the, custody, uh, in the custody of the Christian churches by using the Isnad uh, episteme, then you are committing a very big mistake. They were not supposed to be analyzed or charged against that kind of episteme. But that kind of episteme is quite irrelevant to them. Now, as we also uh, uh, noted that what needed to bridge the gap between perhaps these two epistemes, and we, we classified them into three, actually, not two, this document-based and, and document com is not based and is not based. So what needed to be done to bring together a kind of an integrated epistemology to study this very unique uh, uh, thing in the history of humanity? Uh, I, I think what we did was bringing in the, uh, I mean, the method of parallelism, which is very important, and looking into the ipsisma verba as well, uh, bringing in into consideration, uh, uh, I mean, uh, scribal convention into play, uh, and bringing in also uh, the archaeological data as well. So the evidence have got to be collaborated between all these areas. And, and when a Hadith scholars would like to, to judge the covenant by his own episteme, I, I would say this is ridiculous. This is ridiculous, I mean, and, and, and senseless as, as well. Uh, as well as if you, if you want to uh, uh, charge the Hadith uh, uh, literature, by only a, a, a document-based thing. I mean, if somebody would like to say, well, I'm, I'm going to uh, completely reject the Hadith, it is because of the fact that we haven't seen any document written at the time of the Prophet وسلم, which recorded that specific Hadith. Or maybe, I mean, some would say, even we don't have a copy of the Bukhari which has been written by Bukhari himself, scribed by Bukhari himself. These are all irrelevant issues, I guess, when it comes to epistemology. But rather, we, we felt that there should be this comprehensive way of integrating all these sources together and coming up with or reconstructing a sensible uh, understanding of these documents. I have to caution you on two things when we uh, uh, did our study. Mm -hmm. uh, the first thing is that the covenants were referenced in Bukhari and Muslim uh, on the authority of uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab before he passed away. He was referring to this zimma, uh, which was granted by the Prophet وسلم, to the Christians. And he reminded the community that they have got to uphold that kind of Zimma, which was granted to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to uh, 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 non-Muslim communities. Uh, and the second part, when we studied, we realized that the very idea of a, a political document was not part of the sensibility of the Hadith compilers. That's why, as I said to you, I mean, that a very important document like the Constitution of Medina I won't find it in Bukhari or Muslim or the other uh, books, canonical books of, uh, of the Hadith literature. Does that mean the covenant of the Prophet uh, is useless? No, of course it's not a useless document. It's a very important document for Muslims and for understanding early Islam as well. Uh, Hudaybiyah, for instance, was not the document itself. You won't find it in the Hadith literature. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, Halim, I, I, I know, I mean, you are uh, more, I guess, uh, knowledgeable uh, into this than myself. So I just would like you just to add a few things in this regard. Okay. Um, do I, okay, if you, if you say I have to, then I will. 
uh, I mean, a, a, a review of the hadith uh, that, that talk about Christians uh, highlights for us a particular uh, theme within those narrations um, that, you know, support what, I mean, it, we have to appreciate there were some um, polemics going on between Muslim and Christian uh, theologians at the time the hadith were being written down and uh, compiled. And that seems to have had an influence on which kinds of narrations were recorded and how what, what, what part of the story was recorded and how it was presented. And it seems to be, this seems to play some role in helping us to understand why we don't have more detailed description about uh, the covenants, even in spite of, for example, um, you know, the Sirah of Ibn Ishaq recording uh, that the, the Christians of Najran came and visited the Prophet in his mosque without saying about the document being, uh, pr you know, presented or issued to them. So there's, there's, a, there's a curious issue here about the way in which the Hadith have recorded uh, stories involving Christians um, that, that we, we're writing a paper on at the moment, actually, and we, we'll have more to say about that later. I don't want to take up too much time, though, because there's a couple of questions and there's a, a brother who's been very patient here with his hand up that I have to come to as well. But the final question in the chat here is a good one, and it's about uh, do Sunni and Shia scholars, uh, are they in agreement and acknowledgement about the authenticity of the covenants? Is there a difference between what Sunnis and Shias think? Well, I, I let, let me just start by saying this. It's, it's a very interesting phenomenon in, in the documenting these uh, covenants of the Prophet by the different Christian, uh, by the different communities, I mean, Christians or or non-Christians as well. Uh, the scribal in these documents was either Ali ibn Abi Talib, perhaps who is a champion of uh, Shiaism I mean, for the Shia uh, community, for our brothers who are Shia. I mean, Ali is a very important I mean, figure. So uh, he was there uh, as the scribe, <coughs> excuse me, of the documents which were in the custody of uh, the, the Christians in St. Catherine, I'm sorry. Uh, and that's why it was the first, I guess, to, to recognize the authenticity of this document were the Fatimids uh, when they were uh, the rulers of North Africa and Egypt. Uh, and, and the second document, uh, we, we, were, we were speaking about the scribal lineage, was scribed by Muawiyah. And now there are difficulties, I mean, historical difficulties about uh, whether Muawiyah embraced Islam before the uh, liberation of Mecca or not. But the idea is this, that he was noted by the ecclesiastical historians as the scribe of the Najran covenant, which is in the custody of different uh, Christian uh, denominations, Christian churches, uh, which, I mean, from our study, we realized that perhaps this was reissued by Muawiyah. You have to keep in mind that the, the covenant of Najran was reissued by Abu Bakr, reissued by uh, it was documented, I mean, in our uh, books of Islamic jurisprudence, were reissued by Ali, reissued by uh, uh, Osman, reissued by Ali as well. And finally, uh, it must be reissued also by Muawiyah. So the reissuance of the document at the time when Muawiyah, you have to keep in mind, his seat of power was in uh, Damascus. Uh, uh, where it was very close to the Byzantian Empire at that time. And uh, the Sham at that time was the majority of the population actually were Christian. You have to keep all that, that in mind also. Uh, so for them, it's more comfortable, I guess, and convenient uh, to keep that document which was reissued by Muawiyah. Uh, and, and, uh, but, but that raises also some problems as well. Now to address the question which was raised, uh, obviously I guess the, Christ, the both, I mean the Sunnis as well as the 
the Shia shouldn't have a problem when they are looking to these documents. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the Shia also uh, had in their uh, I mean, uh, sources uh, a clear reference to uh, Ali's uh, covenant with the Magi uh, and, and, and also Ali's covenant with the Christians of Iraq at his time as well. So uh, I don't see any uh, problem between, I mean, Muslims, Shia or, or, or Sunnah when it comes to the, uh, when it comes to the covenants of the prophet. It isn't, I mean, an, an issue at all. It isn't an issue at all. If they like, they can go with the covenant of Ali. If the uh, ultra Sunnah perhaps who will consider Ali and, uh, and only uh, uh, Muawiyah, uh, they can go with the covenant of Najran, which is described by uh, Muawiyah. And for regular Sunnis like myself and yourself, I guess it is there. I mean, the covenants were described by both of them, Ali and Muawiyah. Okay. Uh, last question from the chat before we go to the, the hand that's raised. And this question is a, I mean, this is a tough one. And I don't know if it's a tough one, but it's a, it's a good question. It's about if the covenants of the prophet and the Rashidun were clear that, uh, you know, Kuntu Kasmo Yonul Kiyama, if this is violated, I'll be his foe on the day of judgment. So it was clear that the, that the rights of the Christians and the protection of their places of worship had to be respected. Why is it that we saw violations occur after the, the, the time of the prophet, for example, into the Abbasid period and uh, in, in other, you know, in Egypt, in Syria, in other in other places, in the decades and centuries after the death of the prophet, why, if, if these documents were established, they were known, why why would anyone have violated a, a very clear instruction of the prophet and of uh, his uh, close companions? Uh, let me just be a little bit cynical. I mean, I'm sorry for being cynical, but but uh, you have to keep in mind that some of these Muslim rulers. Uh, I mean, shed the blood of Muslims before shedding the blood of, of non-Muslims. I mean, the brutality that they had against their fellow Muslims, uh, some would say, I mean, it's unprecedented. Uh, so uh, it's no wonder, I mean, some of them were, were not just rulers. Uh, and obviously these were not done in the name of Islam. Of, of course, I mean, uh, Muslims and Muslim uh, scholars uh, were quite aware of the fact that uh, they are human beings and they are susceptible to make mistakes. Some of these mistakes were grave mistakes. Uh, again, it's the principles and the teachings of Islam as well. So we have to make a distinction between the Islam as we know it, the normative one, and Islam which has been applied and realized by the Muslims. We do not condone actually the mistakes which were made by Muslim rulers, they are at fault whenever they harass the Christians or uh, they uh, uh, destroy their places of worship. I just tell you a, a very interesting story uh, in our history books. You know, uh, when uh, the Muslims, we wrote an article on this, when the Muslims uh, put uh, Damascus uh, under siege and finally, they concluded this capitulation treaty, which was done by Khalid ibn al-Walid and the people of Damascus, which were following the same template of the treaties which were uh, done by the Prophet wasallam, and some of the physiology of the covenants of the Prophet were present there. Now, the treaty was concluded and the, uh, the cathedral of uh, of the main cathedral in 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 in, uh, uh, in 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 Damascus of John the Baptist was supposed to be divided between Muslims and and Christians, and uh, this was honored uh, during the time of uh, Muawiyah, during the time of Yazid, during the time of whoever came after, up until. Al up until Abdul Malik ibn Murwan. Uh, 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 and then uh, uh, the time of Al-Walid, I'm sorry, the time of Al-Walid, 
who came and he said to the Christians, well, listen, I'm going to buy your part of the cathedral to include it into the mosque. I mean, he wanted to annex the Christian part into the mosque uh, because he felt that now we are having more Muslims in Damascus uh, and, and he wanted to extend the mosque. Uh, they said to him, no, we have an agreement and we are not going to sell the cathedral, our part of the cathedral to you. Uh, and he wasn't a, actually a, a model, uh, uh, I mean, an Islamic ruler who would follow the teachings of Islam. He said, this is what you say. Okay, I'm going to confiscate it and to hell with you. And he took it and uh, made it part of the mosque. After him, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz was a very righteous person who came to power. The same Christian community, the leaders came to Umar ibn Abdul Aziz and told him, listen, we have an agreement with Khalid ibn al-Walid. And this guy, uh, the Khalifa before you, did not honor that kind of agreement. And we wanted our church back. He said, yeah, you're right. Give them their church back. I mean, we have an agreement. We have to honor that kind of agreement. And the Muslims, I mean, the common Muslims were very upset. How come it is going to be given back to them? Muhammad ibn Abdul Aziz said, no. Justice have got to be served. This is their right. They should be given their right. Then he had a very intelligent lawyer. Uh, who said to Umar Abdul Aziz, let me negotiate with them and I will advise you after that. So he sat with the Christian, it was recorded, sat with the Christian uh, uh, leaders and told them, as the Khalifa said, we are going to give you back your, your church. But you have to keep in mind that the capitulation treaty does not cover churches outside Damascus. Uh, I mean, the land outside Damascus was taken by force. And since they were taken by force, these buildings belong to the Muslims. And the Muslims could do whatever they wanted to do with it. And you don't have any agreement. But we left you all the time, your churches and monasteries, untouched. Now, if you want back your part of uh, John the Baptist Cathedral, uh, we are going to take over all the churches outside the gate of, of Damascus. They said, oh, hold on. <laughs> That's very serious. Can, you, can we renegotiate this by having another treaty where it will cover all the monasteries and churches outside uh, the gated city of Damascus, and we let go of our share of the John Baptist uh, 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 Cathedral. And he said, yes, I don't mind. And then he advised Umar ibn Abdul Aziz accordingly, and Umar Abdul Aziz agreed, and they renewed the thing. Uh, and that's why we have the mosque of Damascus, which was originally, I mean, the, the cathedral. Mm. Now, it's, it's a long story, but I would like to tell you that in our history, there are, uh, I mean, uh, uh, caliphs and commanders of the believers who were just and upright and, uh, and, and uh, righteous as well in their dealings with Muslims and non-Muslims. And there are those who were good for nothing, who committed atrocities against Muslims as well as non-Muslims. Uh, who, I mean, non-Muslims suffered a great deal at their hands than uh, non-Muslims as well. And we do not condone, I mean, these things which were done to the Christians, and we are not proud of them. We are very ashamed of anything which was done against the, uh, what, the commandment of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We have to be very clear on this. If this has been committed by ISIS or committed by anybody at any time, we as Muslims, we are against it, and we are not uh, happy with it, and we have to voice our concerns, uh, but we have also to be realistic, to tell you that in our history, there are dark times 
as well as there are good times in all histories of humanity. And we are not an exception to this. Mm -hmm. Professor Zane, there's a, there's a very important um, comment and question here regarding Hagia Sophia uh, in Istanbul. And you know that there was some discussion about this uh, a couple of years ago, I think, when uh, it was reconverted back from a, a museum to, to a mosque. Um, I, I'm not sure if you feel you have the time to address this question now, or perhaps it's something that we could do, um, you know, um, you know, by email afterwards. Uh, I'm not sure if you wanted to comment on it, um, but there's one gentleman who's had his hand up for a while that, and I know we're out of time now, so I'm not sure which way you want to go. If you feel like we've got an extra five or ten minutes to do both, or if you if you prefer, we just your call. I think we better finish on time. Okay. This is my yeah yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll just take the last well, question then. Listen, 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 yeah, yeah, because he was, as you said, he was very patient. Very patient, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Nurul Kadar, could you please uh, ask a question? If you could make it a brief one, because we, we need to conclude now. Thank you, and and thank you for your patience as well. Um, thank you very much, Professor Halim and Professor Ibrahim Zin for the enlightening session. I'll try to summarize my question. It is because I'm currently co-authoring a paper on the covenant of St. Catherine. That's why I'm very much interested in what has been presented. I'm currently writing with the Turkish historian, Professor Yashar Cholak. But in summary, we have found that there is very thin room for us to authenticate um, the St. Catherine uh, covenant and attribute, attribute it back to Prophet Sallam. Um, we also did a threefold study similar to what uh, Professor Ibrahim mentioned. I understand he was doing a collective study of the covenants. We did more of an individual and we find that it's very imperative to first authenticate individual um, covenants. For instance, um, when we look at the scribal conventions as mentioned by Professor Zin, there are peculiarities in text, in witnesses, in seal. For instance, in the text, uh, it was the word buyut salawati him was used for the Christians. Where if you look at parallel texts, Prophet ﷺ did not use buyut salawati him for kana'is or sawame. So that was one of the peculiarities. Um, the other would be witnesses such as Abu Darda and Abu Huraira, which John Andrew Morrow actually mentioned that um, because he said he claimed that it was contracted during Second Hijrah and Abu Darda and Abu Huraira have yet to embrace Islam. But he claims that Abu Huraira used to frequent Medina and Prophet Sallallahu used to frequent St. Catherine, which we do not have proof for this. So this in an academic paper would be considered as conjectures rather than proof. The second fold would be um, there is no mentioning of the St. Catherine Covenant at all in any of our um, classical texts. Uh, Moro mentions that, and of course, apologies to Moro, but he mentioned that um, he has been, uh, he cited Ibn Sa'ad, Tabakat bin Sa'ad, and also Qasas al uh, by Ibn Kathir. However, we have found that he used a fabricated English translation of Qasas al and we can assure reader, uh, readers that there is no mentioning of it in the Arabic form of Qasas al by Ibn Kathir, and also in Tabakat Ibn Sa'ad. Um, and the second thing is that with all due respect to Professor Ibrahim Zin, of course, you are a scholar, I'm, I'm nobody. And uh, however, I would like to respectfully disagree with you when you mentioned that treatises are absent from hadith books. I, I understand if you are saying about hadith books as in Bukhari and Muslim, or maybe Kutub al-Sitta, Kutub al-Ashara. However, there are a lot of, if, if you look at hadith literature, and when I say hadith literature, it also includes the book of Siras, the book of Shuruh al-Hadith. For instance, you mentioned um, a few examples, uh, Sahif at Medina. Sahif at Medina, as you mentioned, um, was cited by Abu Ubaid al-Qasim in his Kitab al-Amwal. However, he also mentioned it in his Kitab al-Gharib al-Hadith, which is, of course, a book that explains the Gharib of al-Hadith. Um, and you would find Ibn Hajar, for instance, in Fathul Bari, speaking about the Sahif at Medina or um, the Mu'ahada Ma'an Najran. So you'd see the Hadith literature is more complex than just Mutun al-Hadith. And if you explore more, we would find that there are mentioning of this. And you also mentioned Sulhul Hudaybiya. It is actually mentioned in Bukhari in length, in Hadith 2731 and 2732. And um, Fatul Bari, in Fatul Bari, Ibn Hajar actually commented that Bukhari mentioned in different places. So my point is that, yes, I understand that it might not be in Kutub Sitta or Kutub Al-Ashara. However, I think it's very um, problematic to dismiss that the Hadith 
collection did not compile these narrations and if it did not then how do we how do we then ascertain this i think when it comes to saint catherine in particular not talking about the other covenants um, i think a more appropriate argument would be the argument from silent um, in addition to um, collaborative evidences we also mentioned of course these are secondary evidences uh, but there are fatawas from Jami, uh, from azhar university um, such as the one by um, the late egyptian scholar who is of course um, he has appraisal of Egypt and Islam, um, the late Sheikh Atiyah Sakar, who actually denied the existence of such covenant being attributed to Prophet Muhammad So uh, maybe you can enlighten us on this. Thank you very much and uh, sorry for uh, giving such a long comment. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I mean, thank you very much really for, for the information uh, that you shared with us uh, from your research. And I'm pretty sure, I mean, uh, they are going to enlighten us on, on some of these issues uh, that you raised. But I'm saying this, uh, epistemologically speaking. Now, uh, if we are speaking about the Hadith, uh, it's different from uh, the documents in the custody of the Christians. Uh, so there must be some uh, transmission nuances. Now, when I said that we have to keep in mind that uh, documents like uh, uh, the Constitution of Medina was not uh, into Bukhari, Muslim, and the other, uh, uh, I mean, uh, four or, or perhaps all the books of the Hadith recognized by by uh, uh, by the Sunnis. I mean, you add. Uh, Malik and you add uh, Musnad uh, uh, Raz, uh, Ahmad ibn Hanbal and, and all these books we researched this and we realized that uh, no uh, you won't find the constitution of Medina in any of these and, and uh, the reference to Hudaybiya also was not a reference to the text of Hudaybiya but rather was reference to what transpired in uh, negotiating the Hudaybiya uh, treaty. I mean, in the books of the Hadith, it's not the text itself. I mean, you wouldn't find it in the text. Now, the commentaries, of course, I mean, some of these commentaries uh, refer to books of, of, I mean, Ibn Hajar and others would refer to books of, uh, of, 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 of the biography of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I mean, uh, Ibn Ishaq and the other, uh, books that has that have uh, some information about the life of the Prophet Wasallam. But I don't think that that somebody will take this as hadith. And some of these were having collective uh, uh, were having collective uh, isnad. And you know that the muhaddisun, I mean, in their work, I mean, they are very critical of this very idea of collective isnad. I know that Abu uh, Ubaid uh, al-Qasim has a very specific isnad in his Kitab al-Amwal about the, about the constitution of Medina. But we have to keep in mind that the constitution of Medina, which was way before Abu uh, Ubaid uh, ibn al-Qasim, Abu Ubaid al-Qasim ibn Salam, in his book Kitab al-Amwal, it has a collective isnad in the biography of the Prophet Sirat ibn Ishaq. I mean, we don't have a specific uh, narrative. Uh, we don't have a specific chain of transmission in Ibn Ishaq. Obviously, we don't have the copy of Ibn Ishaq, which has been edited by the Syrian scholar, uh, doesn't have that part of, of the constitution of Medina. Okay, it only uh, finished at the beginning of, of the Hijrah of the Prophet But the seerah which has been uh, edited by Ibn Hisham, it doesn't have a collective, it, it doesn't have a specific isnad, it does have a collective isnad. And you know uh, that the muhaddisun will have difficulty actually to swallow that kind of collective isnad. And most important of all, I mean, uh, I mean the muhaddisun of Medina were very unhappy with uh, Ibn Ishaq, who compiled uh, the 
the biography of the Prophet وسلم, to the extent he was kicked out of the Medina. We have to keep all these things in mind. Now, when you go back to the sixth century when Ubaid al Qasim ibn Salam wrote his book, and he had in this gharib, he had two gharibs, a gharib of, of, of language and a gharib of hadith, as you rightly mentioned. But it's still, uh, that can't be considered as a book of hadith. Uh, it's a book, perhaps in that sense, a book of, of language, not a book of hadith, in that sense. Uh, so, but I, again, I, I will really look, really look into some of the observations, I mean, intelligent observations that you made, and I'm very grateful to you. Uh, but it's still, I, I stand on that disposition that uh, the absence of the covenants or copies of the covenants uh, or these documents from the Hadith literature should not be taken against these copies. And, and the parallelism that I made and the example that I showed about the constitution of Medina or Sulh al Hudaybiyah or any other uh, important documents of early Islam uh, is, is a clear evidence on this. But again, thank you very much, I guess, and I hope that you share with me your, your, your write up. Uh, and I'll be very grateful, I guess, to modify some of the uh, I mean, positions that I have taken myself and, uh, uh, and Ahmed al-Wakil as well. Excellent. That's what uh, these opportunities are all about, is uh, to share our research and our findings and uh, have discussions together so that we can move uh, you know, our knowledge forward. Uh, please, everyone, uh, join me in thanking Professor Ibrahim Zain for his absolutely enlightening presentation this evening. Thank you, Professor Zain. Uh, we really appreciate your time uh, coming and giving us uh, the keynote address for our 2021 AIMS conference, and we wish you all the best with the very important research that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, really. I'm delighted to be with you, and it was a great opportunity for me as well. Thank you. Salam. Thank you everyone for joining us and uh, please uh, register for other sessions uh, of the conference. And uh, you know, we look forward to seeing you in some of those sessions over the next two days. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>